This is 9-11 Free Talk. Gentlemen, welcome to another episode of 9-11 Free Fall. My name is Andy Steele, and I am the host. Tonight, we'll be talking with civil engineer and AE 9-11 Truth board member Roland Angle about his team's outreach at the annual conference of the ASCE Structural Engineering Institute that happened in Orlando last week. That interview is coming your way right now. The views expressed on this show by guests and the hosts on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. graduated from the University of California, Berkeley with a degree in civil engineering. He served in the U.S. Army Special Forces where he was trained in the use of explosives and he became a licensed civil engineer in California. His 50 years of engineering experience has included designing and testing of blast-hardened missile launch facilities and designing U.S. naval explosive containers along with harbor terminal facilities, earth foundation systems, and hydraulic systems. In addition, Roland has owned three construction companies and has taught engineering subjects to high school students. He is currently a board member of AE 911 Truth, and he is the head of Project Due Diligence. Roland, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me on, Andy. Well, thank you for all the great work you're doing. You're on fire right now. You've got volunteers going to various venues giving the presentations that are part of Project Due Diligence. I can't even keep up with them, getting them on this program to talk about their experiences there, but that's a problem I like having, and you're the one responsible for that. So we should all be thanking you and your tireless efforts. So we're going to be talking about your recent endeavor out there in Orlando, but I'm always worried that we pick up new listeners all the time and people may not have followed every single effort that we have put forth over the years and may have uh, missed the beginnings of Project Due Diligence. So please explain to our audience briefly what Project Due Diligence is. Project Due Diligence is our effort to educate the engineering community regarding the contents of the uh, National Institutes of Standards and Technologies reports on the three buildings that failed at the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. NIST issued those reports uh, in 2005. They issued the report on the Twin Towers, and uh, 2008 they issued the report on Building 7. Since then, we have been going through those reports, which amounts to more than 10,000 pages of documents, and requesting further information from the government uh, regarding the uh, specifications of the buildings. And we have come up with information that is extremely important to the engineering community in regards to the content of those reports because the conclusions that the reports come to, which essentially said that the buildings were brought down by fire, the towers were hit first by the planes, but the effects of the fire afterwards were essentially what caused the buildings to collapse, in the opinion of NIST. And Building 7 was never hit by a plane, and... NIST concludes that the building came down later that day as a result of office fires. We have combed through that information looking at the evidence that NIST reports, and we found serious errors, omissions, 
and internal contradictions in those reports that invalidate their conclusions. So we're calling for a new investigation into the building failures, and we are attempting to educate the engineering community as to the contents of those reports because what we're finding is that what we would expect most engineers in the field have not looked at the building reports that were issued by NIST and they don't know the contents of the reports and they certainly haven't had time that we have devoted to it in the form of thousands of hours of research to come to the conclusion that the significant errors, omissions, and contradictions within the reports invalidate their conclusions. So we're taking that information. We've summarized our, our findings. We've got about an 80-minute presentation that we can present to these groups of engineers and we ask them to support us in our call for a new investigation. So that's what Project Due Diligence is all about. It's about us doing our due diligence to make sure that the efforts surrounding this major engineering failure are disseminated throughout the engineering profession so that people are aware of what the problems are and they can take a position that is consistent with the facts. Right now, the NIST reports uh, take a position that is not compatible with the facts and the evidence, and we believe that that needs to change. Well, that is Project Due Diligence in a nutshell, and I remember you giving that presentation in San Francisco, and it was an excellent presentation. There was a video made of it. A lot of volunteers show that video in their outreach, and it's not just Roland Angle going to these various professional venues. It's volunteers from all over the country, and they've been featured here on 9-11 Free Fall to give their report from the ground, from their outreach uh, at these places, and a lot of positive results happening, and it's just getting started, and this is exactly what we need to do, is reach out to the professional community, get more engineers involved, and in particularly even the, the younger ones, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But bringing Roland on today, because they did a major outreach at a ASCE conference in Orlando last week. So again, just keeping in mind that there may be people that are new to uh, this whole issue and may not be very familiar with what the ASCE is and what goes on at these conferences. Can you tell them first what the ASCE is and what the purpose of the conference overall was in Orlando? The American Society of Civil Engineers is the oldest civil engineering profession in the United States. It goes back to the mid-19th century. And they are the largest and most well-known known of the uh, engineering professional organizations. They have a number of sub-organizations that operate under the umbrella of the ASCE. One of them is the Structural Engineering Institute, which they founded in 1995. And that organization is focused on structural engineering, and the structural engineers that participate in that, that organization are involved in ongoing projects that are aimed at educating the structural engineering profession, keeping them up to date with latest developments, and providing a forum for them to uh, meet and to confer and to network so that people can stay up to date and the best interest of the profession can be promoted. One of the things that they do is they have yearly conferences. This was their yearly structural conference. It was held in Orlando from April 24th to the 27th, and about 1,100 engineers attended. They have exhibitions, different vendors, and contractors that interact with the structural engineering profession. They have workshops uh, on various aspects of the professional practice. They have leaders of the community speaking and giving 
inspiration and direction to the uh, rank and file engineers that come in to see these uh, conferences. And it's uh, similar to all the organizations, all professional organizations do this. This is one of the ones that is provided for structural engineers. There are other structural engineering associations. This one is associated with American Society of Civil Engineers. So we aimed at this particular organization because the ASCE and SEI were involved in the investigation of the building failures that occurred at the World Trade Center on 9-11 in 2001. So that's why we focused on these organizations because they have experience in this particular area. They were involved in the investigation, the evidence, and the reports that came out of that, and we are trying to reach their members with our message. So you have a conference for structural engineers, the heavy focus there. You have an organization that was uh, somewhat involved in crafting the official story. And, of course, here we are, AE 9-11 Truth, with years of research, uh, many hours of documentary footage and published articles and uh, all sorts of materials for outreach that document the problems with the NIST report, uh, with the official story, a point to evidence of controlled demolitions of the Twin Towers and World Trade Center 7. So the ASCE must be really interested in this information. And when you contacted them saying that you wanted to give a presentation at their conference, did they welcome you with open arms, Roland? We came a little bit late on the scene. So we never submitted a... This year, we were unable to submit a an application to make a performance at their convention because they... Right now, for instance, they are just accepting applications for next year's performance next spring, and that application process closes about 10 months before the convention. So we were not organized enough to get on board to apply to make a presentation at the convention per se. What we wanted to do was to get a room in the hotel, a meeting room, and we would present our information uh, at that meeting and attempt to get their members to attend. So we did apply to get a, uh, a booth in their exhibition hall, and uh, they rejected that request. And they said that we were. Uh, they said that we were not. Uh, I'm trying to get the exact words that they had here. They said essentially that our information was not compatible with the goals and objectives of their convention. And that was uh, the response that they gave to us. We got back to them, and we were talking to an individual there via email that's one of their sales managers. And we said, well, could you please tell us how what we have to say is in contradiction to the goals and objectives of ASCE and SEI, and the individual involved, who was, as I said, a sales manager, said, well, I have the authority to make that decision, and I've made it, and and he refused to explain his position further. So, evidently, uh, the ASCE hierarchy is not uh, okay with what we have to say, and they have empowered people, in this case, somebody who doesn't have an engineering background, to make decisions regarding whether or not we're going to be allowed to have any kind of presence at their convention. So we failed in our ability to get a a booth at the convention hall, but we did register four people, and we applied for a meeting room in the hotel. This was the Hyatt in Orlando, and they said that they would they could not allow us to have a meeting room in the hotel because ASCE has a veto power over any other groups that are in the hotel while they're having their convention there. And that's a standard clause in the contracts that these folks that hold conventions have. So there's nothing unusual there. But ASCE chose to exercise their veto and prevent us from having a meeting hall in the Grand Hyatt. So we went to the hotel next door, which was the Rosen Center Hotel, which is across the street, and we rented a room there. 
and we uh, had a meeting on Thursday night from 7 to 9 p.m. The uh, conference was running from early registration on Wednesday night, and it ran through Saturday. So we picked the time that we thought was most advantageous for trying to get folks to come and see it, and it was held, uh, as I said, in the Rosen Center in one of their meeting rooms on Thursday night. So our efforts to get the material in front of the uh, attendees was limited by the fact that ASCE did everything within their power to keep us from away from their attendees. However, they couldn't stop us from registering. We registered four engineers, and we showed up with our flyers, and we passed out flyers and advertised our event as best we could, got out about 630 flyers, and got a generally friendly reception. Uh, And then that night, Thursday night, about a half a dozen people from the convention showed up along with about a half a dozen people that we had from our local support group, and we gave the presentation to them in the Rosen Center Hotel on Thursday evening. Now, I was being a little sarcastic earlier because I know that uh, what I those what I term to be part of the official story mob where the, sort of the machine uh, comes together and, and tries to keep this... Uh, evidence from being presented to a wide range of people. And that's that's part of the problem that we face, is that a lot of engineers don't even know about this controversy. They haven't thought twice about it. Their only encounters uh, with the issue of Building 7, for instance, is when they meet somebody from AE 9-11 Truth, and then they try to shut down any discussion of that and not provide a venue for it. It makes me wonder, Roland, you know, with this important issue of World Trade Center 7, for instance, uh, even if you believe the official story, even if you're on the other side of this issue, uh, it seems like discussion of this should go on for decades to keep uh, something like that from ever happening again. They don't want to allow you to talk there or to even rent out a meeting room at the hotel. Um, what were some of the stuff that was being presented at this conference that was so much more important? They had some workshops that were of interest we attended, uh, the four of us attended various workshops. They had one, for instance, called Becoming an Agent of Change and Innovation, which I went to. And this was a workshop that's in recognition of the fact that, like any established institution, there's a desire for, a conservative desire for stability and continuation. And that can stifle innovation and stifle people that have new ideas, uh, innovative approaches to solving problems. And so this was a workshop that was aimed at how uh, to uh, overcome that resistance. So I found it to be useful. They didn't, of course, discuss uh, 9-11 when they did bring up uh, problems from the past. They talked about some of the engineering failures in the past like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, the Hyatt uh, Hotel collapse in Kansas City, and uh, there was another one there. I don't have my notes in front of me. But at any rate, they they are attempting some elements with it. Listen, ASCE and, and SEI, the overwhelming majority of their members are conscientiously trying to fulfill their role in society of providing safe structures for the public to use. And it's a contradiction that some elements within the leadership were brought into the World Trade Center catastrophe early on, and they were influenced in some way through coercion or enticements or whatever. I, I really don't know. I don't know what went on inside that small group of people. But they were brought on board with the what became the official narrative that the fires were the cause of the collapses early on, and they early on acted to shut down any narrative that would have pointed towards any other uh, expertise, any other explanation for why the buildings collapsed, such as controlled demolition and explosives. So that leadership has been able to quell any effective discussion 
of any other alternative explanation. And they have essentially, uh, I call it, they've, they've withdrawn into the castle, pulled up the drawbridge, and are refusing to have any discussion. None of the people that I talked to about the information that we have w- took any exception to the information itself. There's nobody that says, well, you're wrong about this and here's why. They simply refuse to discuss it. Uh, although most of the engineers that we talked to were friendly and accepted our information, none of them were willing to challenge us based upon any knowledge that they had about the event. And that leads me to believe that most of them don't have much knowledge about the event and haven't investigated it, which is understandable given the tens thousand plus pages of reports is a would require a massive effort on the part of any individual so we only accomplished our research through the efforts of literally hundreds of people over a long period of time so it's not reasonable to expect that the average engineer is going to be able to comb through all that information and come up with the conclusions that we have you have to be knowing what you're looking for and you have to have the manpower the woman power to go through that information and collect it and put it in some sort of a comprehensible form, which is what we've done. They have they have uh, uh, workshops on blast analysis of industrial structures, failures when engineers make mistakes. Um, uh, they have uh, some. They have one that is on. Uh, uh, what they call now, they don't talk about progressive collapse anymore. They call about, they have one called disproportionate collapse. They have uh, an ongoing project talking about a new standard for mitigation of disproportionate collapse. Well, disproportionate collapse is what they're talking about happened with World Trade Center 7, for instance. They're saying the NIST report says that a failure at a local connection between a girder and a column caused a chain of events which led to the collapse of the entire building in seven seconds. So this exercise that they're going through now is supposedly aimed at preventing events of that type from ever happening again. Of course, the explanation that NIST gave for how that building collapsed doesn't make any sense. So in a sense, they're chasing a rainbow and they're they're coming up with a new standard to uh, prevent an event from happening that never happened. So in that sense, uh, it's it's like a dog chasing its tail. They're never going to catch it. But it came out of the World Trade Center building failures. They don't talk about that directly, but that's why they're having that discussion now. It's part of the legislation that was passed in 2002 after the buildings came down the Congress passed the National Construction Safety Team Act, which created the NIST reports and gave the NIST organization the authorization to establish the cause for the building failures and to set up uh, ongoing methods for investigating such failures in the future. So what we saw at the convention was a report by some of these teams that have been formed as a result of that and are studying coming up with new code provisions or new methodologies for uh, investigating these events with the intent of preventing them from happening in the future. Of course, it's all very ironic because what they're studying is a false report, and the conclusions that they're going to come to are going to be useless because uh, they're not related to what actually happened. So you mentioned before that you were reaching out to people on the convention floor, and I think this is a good teaching moment for our supporters and volunteers out there who might be listening. Can you tell us uh, about some of those interactions? How did you and your volunteers approach people, and what was a good opening line? One of our volunteers, Gene Johnson, came up with the notion that we should have a loop of Building 7 collapsing, a short video, on our iPads and use that to approach 
engineers, and it works very well. I had one, and it had a uh, this uh, an opening line that said, "Did you know a third building collapsed at the World Trade Center on 2009/11?" And then it had a couple of uh, videos, about 15 seconds of videos showing the building collapse from two different camera perspectives, and then uh, the la- and then it closed by asking them to attend our presentation that night. So that was a very very useful tool because you could approach people and say, I've got a 30-second video I want you to watch. And as soon as they saw the building come down, of course, they were engrossed. And while the video was playing, you could simply inform them that the building that they were seen collapsing, according to NIST, was coming down due to normal office fires. And we felt that that conclusion was invalid, and we would have a discussion of that at our meeting. So that was a very useful technical tool, uh, very impressive, had a good response, engaged in a few conversations at some length, but you got to keep in mind, these are people going to a convention, they have their schedule laid out for the day, they're on their way from somewhere to somewhere, there's not much time in between for the most part. So very few people stop and spend any time really discussing what that meant. Afterwards, a few people did, uh, and I, the ones that did, pretty much understood that we were talking about a very controversial subject, since NIST uh, was saying something that clearly defied the, what everybody understands as the basic knowledge of structural engineering. Uh, it becomes a controversial subject, and the fact that there is no controversy about a controversial subject is the controversy. So. People understood what we were getting at, and I'm sure that 95% of them got the picture right away. You know, the question of what they could do about it is another thing. These are all folks that have devoted their life to their professional career path. They've obtained credentials. They are uh, leaders in the field. They uh, have a longstanding relationship with ASCE and SEI. Some of them actually work for NIST. A lot of them work for major government contractors that have contracts with the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, uh, large firms with big government contracts. These are not folks that are going to be inclined to tackle the question of what happens when a governmental report on a major event uh, has problems. So... We're getting the word out that there are people that are willing to make this challenge, but as far as getting a lot of them to be on board with it, I have never been of the opinion that we were going to be successful in getting the ASCE and SEI to change their position on the building failures. It would just involve a, a too much of, a, of an expose to the problems that went into the making of those reports, and I don't think they're in a position to take that on. That's just not what happens in in real life. Now, just from your own estimation, it doesn't have to be exact, but in the people you reached out to and who you saw on the convention floor in mass, what percentage of them would you say were under 40? And as a part B to that question, do you think that youth helps or hinders somebody in being willing to look into this issue? Uh, I would say the proportion of younger people there was probably about maybe a quarter to a third. And there were also quite a few older members that were most often in positions of leadership. But there's a perceived problem in the engineering profession they're they're making specific efforts to reach out to younger members and especially to women. So they know that they need to recruit people from those groups if they're going to have a viable and a, and a dynamic future. So they're making a real effort to do that. As far as what the attitude is, how it might vary according to age, uh, I would say that Like all things, I think younger people are more open to new ideas that may be challenging the establishment. It's 
sort of goes with the territory of being young. However, again, these are folks that are already well into their careers. They've spent a lot of time and money on their education. They've gotten to a certain position. Uh, a lot of them are working for major corporations, big government agencies. It tends to make them conservative. And engineers by their nature are conservative. So you have a double whammy there. Engineers are not, this is not the entertainment industry. This is people that have to come up with answers whose careers depends upon those answers being right. They're going to be conservative. Even if you show them something like a video of the building coming down and saying that a government agency said that that building came down as a result of fire, they're not going to jump for the most part right up and say, oh, gee, that's terribly wrong. Let's find out what we can do about it. They're going to they're going to approach that question very cautiously. They're just not of of a of a mindset to uh, leap to conclusions. That's not what they do, and I can respect that. Uh, I'm just trying to point out that there are engineers. We have over three thousand engineers and architects that have signed our petition calling for a new investigation, and that. Regardless of the other consequences of this event, we have a professional duty to the public to stand up for the known knowledge base that our profession has been built on. And if we know that a major engineering report on a major engineering catastrophe contains errors, then we have a professional duty to expose those errors now and and come to a conclusion that is based uh, on the evidence. However, then reality intervenes and says, well, that may be true, but what about my job? What about my career? What about my family? What about my commitment? How am I going to juxtapose what you're saying needs to be done with my personal situation? So that's a, that's a struggle that everybody has to face on their own. So all we're doing is giving them the evidence and asking them to consider it and asking them to take a position calling for a new investigation. We think that's what needs to be done professionally and ethically from the standpoint of our training and experience. That's right. And also, research costs nothing. If you don't want to speak out, you can, at the very least, in the privacy of your home, look up the materials from AE 911 Truth, download the NIST report, research it for yourself, even just out of curiosity, and learn what the arguments are. Know what the actual official story says happened and how that is impossible. Make your own determinations, though. Don't just listen to me. Don't just listen to Roland. And if you do it in the privacy of your own home, at least you're knowledgeable about the topic so that when the temperature in the room gets to a certain point where it might be more advantageous or easier for you to speak out, you can do that. We're trying to make the conditions such that more people can speak out from our end. Uh, Roland, you might have mentioned this before, but if you did, I didn't catch it. How many people from the floor were you able to get to go to the presentation in the hotel room later? And how many people did you have at that presentation? We had 12 people there. Six of them came from the convention, and six of them came from our outreach to our supporters in the Orlando area. Actually, some of them came from as far away as Tampa. So that tells you right there the difficulty of, well, there there are various factors there now. It's easy to be very discouraged about that figure. You got six people. There were 1,100 people at the convention. That's a very, very tiny ratio. But we did get out 630 flyers. Those flyers were not being thrown around. We didn't see any in the trash, any discarded. So we know that 630 people got our information. It uh, is a very effective flyer that we designed for use at these conventions, and it has essential aspects of the arguments that we're making. It gives the website address where they can find out more information. So we're hopeful that a fair percentage of those people follow up. It's certainly a topic of interest, but again, sort of a forbidden topic of interest. But as you say, once they get home, once they get into a private situation where they can follow up on the information, we just hope that there's a significant number of them that do we think our evidence is convincing. All of the engineering 
presentations that we made in front of groups of engineers, we have never had one single engineer get up and challenge any of the evidence that we are presenting or tell us that they thought that they would support the NIST report if they had to sign it. So we know that if we can have a chance to get this information in front of engineers, we're going to get 100% agreement with our position. That's been our experience. So we're confident in our information. And the fact that the leadership refuses to let us even be in the door so that we can present our information is evidence that they understand that our information is compelling as well. So we're very confident about that. It's just a struggle, like with any uh, minority position, to get it in front of uh, an established group that has a reason to continue to go on doing business the way they've always done business because it it satisfies their economic needs and they are going to pursue those economic needs maybe in spite of the best interests of the public whom they are supposed to be serving. Well, it's a, a difficult position many people are in, especially now in our society with the way things are going. And so you do want to look out for your personal interests in terms of providing for your family. But you can't stay quiet when you have such a tremendous injustice being done, especially when it results in the mass murder of thousands of people. So that is the dilemma. But again, research costs nothing to look into it, even if you don't believe our position, even if uh, you have a knee-jerk reaction to immediately dismiss it. Find out why you dismiss it. Look into the arguments and try to make a good case against it. Now, I like good questions. You said nobody's ever stood up and challenged you, but I like it when people ask probing questions because it shows that they're trying to wrap their mind around the issue for the first time, and we love answering them. Roland, what kind of questions did you get during the presentation? Essentially, most people don't have any questions about the technical aspect of it. There was one engineer there who came from the uh, Washington, D.C. area and is a government consultant on the question of blast resistant structures, a very knowledgeable guy. And he was there and he wanted to find out what we had to say. And he was, he had a question about a particular part of the analysis where we had examined this claim that a corner of the building on the 13th floor fell and caused a cascade of floors below it. He had a question about the structural model that NIST used and that it was not nearly stiff enough because it didn't take into account the interaction between the floors and the frame of the building. And we agreed with that. Uh, I think he had some further questions, which actually I'm going to get back to him. Uh, He left his contact information. So he was the rare individual that comes forward that is actually involved in this endeavor of examining what happens when structures collapse due to blasts, and he wants to know what we had to say. So we didn't actually talk about blasts destroying the structure because we're focused on what NIST says caused the structures to collapse, and they, of course, ruled out explosives. We're, we were talking about their explanation that fires brought the building down. So there was, there's somewhat, uh, we may not have satisfied him in that respect because he was probably looking for uh, what kind of blasts would have been used and how would they be placed and what kind of explosives and, and things of that nature. But since those were not discussed in this report, that's not what we're reporting on. However, people like him who are knowledgeable about what it takes to bring a structure down using explosives would be our natural audience. However, most of them are involved, like he is, uh, as employees of the government or contractors to the government, and therefore they are in that group of people that is, by, by virtue of their position, not open to having this kind of discussion because of the effect it might have on their professional career. Other questions that came up, as I said, the presentation of this material to engineering groups, it most often produces a kind of a shock that this kind of a report has been accepted as an acceptable explanation for what happened when it is so clearly wrong on so many levels. Uh, the data input, 
the uh, modeling and the assumptions and the things that are ignored. So, you know, we don't, we don't get much in the way of technical questions. It's really very rare to have anyone raise any issue that has anything to do with the technical aspects of what we're what we have uh, presented. It's just not happening. Our our research is very thorough. We know what we're talking about. We give them all the ties, all the links uh, to the documents that we have gotten the evidence from. We've never had anybody come back and say, you know, I looked at this document and uh, I question your evidence here and your conclusion there. It just hasn't happened. And once again, it may be because the evidence is so overwhelming, but I think our presentation and our connection to the evidence is is secure. We are willing and open to any kind of criticism, any kind of discussion. And as yet, most of the discussion immediately veers off into areas of questions about, well, who would have done this? How could they have gotten away with it? Uh, so on and so forth, which we're don't take a position on because it's not an engineering question. It's a law enforcement question, legal question, political question. We're not experts in that area. We're talking about the evidence and that's what we want to have the conversation about. Turns out there's not much conversation to have because the evidence that we have is uh, so overwhelming and convincing that people just, they simply don't know what to do with it. It takes a while for people to get their head around the fact that this report is uh, a misrepresentation of what happened that day and all the events that stem from that uh, event have been based upon a misconception of what happened. So that's a big, big issue for people to confront once they understand that the basis for the decision-making was flawed. Yeah, people trying to get their head around the facts and the asking of those questions is a very natural reaction to it. Of course, as Roland said, we don't take a position on who did it or why or what the big picture was. We just focus on the technical aspects of what took place inside the towers on that morning and the evidence of controlled demolition. But it's very natural for people to ask that, and I think I even did when I first came across this evidence. One of the biggest problems that I think we face is that, okay, they can meet Roland Angle at a convention floor. This is your typical person. And, and uh, let's say you have an encounter with somebody who may not even be an engineer, but maybe a staff worker uh, who's accompanying an engineer, or you're just out on the street, you see Roland on your phone or talk to them. It makes a great case for the controlled demolition of the towers, but then they go to some official source and it's another guy making some other case and it doesn't matter how unfactual the other guy is. It doesn't matter uh, how much spin is taking place because the guy is in a suit and talking jargon terms. You don't know what to believe. You don't know who to believe. So people a lot of times take the default position that, well, uh, I'm going to go with the official person even if they don't understand really the deep aspects of this issue. And I just want to get your thoughts on that, Roland. I mean, how much do you feel the technical nature of this issue has hindered the general public from getting involved? I think it's been central, really. It's it's key thing. Uh, that's why we're going to the engineering profession and reaching out to the engineering profession, not with our theory, but with an analysis of the government's theory. We're taking the information that was issued that contains scientific and engineering evidence and theories, and we are examining that, and we're showing that it is faulty, it is erroneous, it is uh, misconception, it's misinformation. So engineers, when, as I said, when we discuss this information, when we're able to present our findings to a group of engineers, it's it's 100 percent. There's no no engineer that understands the principles and practice of engineering has ever confronted what we have to say and says that we're wrong. It just doesn't happen. However, we understand that the average person, when we give this information to them, they're not going to know how to, to deal with it because they don't have the scientific background. They don't have the experience. They don't have the training. We're talking to people that have spent four, five, 
six years getting an education that may have many years of experience in the field. They, this is their field. We're, we're experts in this field. This is a field of experts. So the fact that it requires an expert to analyze the information has proven to be a major tripping stone for the public because as I've had many people say to me, well, you guys are experts and they have their experts and they say one thing and you say another thing, so who am I going to believe? So they throw up their hands and say, well, it's a controversy, but I don't understand it and the government says one thing and then it comes down to a question of does this person typically believe the government or does this person typically question the government? If they typically believe the government, then they're going to go with this theory. If they typically question the government, they're going to be more open to what we have to say. And maybe they'll be have enough uh, time, enough inclination to follow it up and look at the information a little bit more seriously, have somebody explain to them what some of these terms and some of these analyses means, and come to a fuller understanding and make a better decision that's based upon more knowledge. But, yeah, the fact that it's a, it's a technical field and it requires an education and experience to understand the nuances is definitely uh, a hindrance to the uh, general public understanding our position. That's why we realize that the engineers are a key element of the population. If we can't build a base amongst the engineers to take a position, we're not going to get far. So we know this is a long process. Engineers are not going to just jump on board with us because they hear what we have to say. Even if they understand that we're right, they have to then consider, well, how is this going to affect me? What's my responsibility? How can I meet that responsibility? Uh, and our point is that there's safety in numbers. That's why we're reaching out to the engineering profession as a group. As individuals, nobody can stand up to this. As a group, we take professional positions as a group. We have an opportunity to really strike a blow for freedom of information and a, a, a real understanding based in science on what's going on in our society. Amen. I think that as more people start to distrust government explanations, that'll help us out in the long run. So it's good to plant the seed early and get this information in their minds. Uh, now, jumping back to the professional community, we've got the World Trade Center 7 study that's going to come out pretty soon here. And in your view, how much do you think the coming release of that study will affect your work at PDD? It'll have a big effect because what I've seen of the study so far, and I've seen the preliminary results, it really gives us a tool to say definitively that the World Trade Center 7 study that was issued by NIST could not possibly be true. We can show what must have happened, how it must have been taken down, and what it would have taken to get a collapse that we observed that day. So it's a big step for us. And we're going to reach out to the academics. We're going to reach out to the profession uh, of civil engineering and structural engineering. We're going to say, we have an academic study now. Here's what it shows. You really need to look at this. And, of course, academia and the professions are tied closely together, together with the government. So the fact that we can have a study that was conducted at a major academic institution by uh, people that are uh, authorities in their field, it's going to give us a lot of gravitas that it's going to be hard to ignore. So we're looking forward to that. It's going to hopefully... Uh, be uh, a big step forward for us. Uh, we know it will be a big step for us. And there's a lot of people that have been waiting for this uh, with bated breath. So once it comes out, we're going to do everything we can to take full advantage of its weight. Yeah, I know I personally can't wait either. And this is going to be a very big game changer in the whole debate. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that we have engineers out there, maybe somebody that met Roland at this conference last week listening to this show, and people who have been awakened to all of the evidence and they want to help out. So Roland, it's a two-part question. Please tell us first, uh, what are the requirements to be a project due diligence volunteer to be a presenter? And... Also, if you are an engineer, but you don't want to present, you're not really a public speaking type, what are some of the ways that they can also help out in the effort? To be a project due diligence 
volunteer. You have to be a, a credentialed engineer. We're looking primarily for civil, structural, and mechanical engineers because their practice and education most closely conforms to the base of knowledge that we need to understand what happened to the buildings. We will accept other engineers. We do have some electrical engineers, chemical engineers, petroleum engineers, and so on. So that's the first thing. You have to have the credential, have to have the degree, have to have the license. We vet all of our volunteers that want to be part of it, and we make sure that they meet these criteria. And then the second thing is if there's a variety of ways that we can have participation. You don't have to be a project due diligence volunteer, which these are the folks that are going out and making the presentations across the country. There's other ways that people can contribute. They can uh, help us with phone calls. Uh, we're reaching out to these various branches and chapters via email and phone calls and to set up our presentations. So there's a lot of work to be done there. They can give money. They can give presentations or small talks to groups in maybe their neighborhood, a neighborhood organization, a church group, so on and so forth. We have a shorter version that's aimed at the lay public that takes out a lot of the technical aspects that we're getting ready to um, have online so that people can refer to that, can use that, and helping us in organizational ways, writing for us, um, there's just a variety of ways. If they're interested in, in getting involved, they can go to the website and contact our staff, and we'll begin the process. Uh, they can sign the petition, which is online, if they're a credentialed person, and we will check them out and then contact them to see if they're interested in participating in the project due diligence itself. Absolutely. There's lots of work to do for the people that want to do it. And Roland, just on a personal note to end it off with, how, how do you keep yourself so energized? I mean, you're doing so much work here. How do you keep your head in the game and carrying on this mission after all of these years? I guess that's a fair question. You know, my father was stationed aboard the USS Arizona when it was sunk at Pearl Harbor. And by just a sheer stroke of luck, he was on shore leave at a training school when that happened. But he had been on that ship for three and a half years. There were 1,775 men that went down on that ship. He lost a lot of friends that day. I was born a couple of months later. I grew up in a household where that tragedy was always there in the background. You know, not many of us have had that experience. Of if you woke up one day and several hundred of your friends and acquaintances were all dead on the same day. Uh, it's hard to imagine. But I lived that experience secondhand through my father. So I know in my bones what it's like to go through a horrible experience like that. And I think I'm in a position now where I can do something. I'm retired. I have the time. Fortunately, I still have the health and the energy. And this is something that I care about deeply. So I'm just doing what I can do, that's all. And I have the training. This came down, and as it so happened, it came down right in the middle of my profession. So a bunch of coincidences and my own personal history and background had a lot to do with why I have the commitment that I have. Roland Angle, ever upward. Keep on doing what you're doing because it's working. And thank you so much for coming on 9-11 Free Fall today. Thanks for having me, Andy. This program is on every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also keep track of the archives by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele saying a great week. Good luck. Good luck.